welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. We're many parts of one body and we belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Don't just pretend to love, really love. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good, love with genuine affection, and take delight in honouring each other. Not to be lazy, work hard, serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice, be patient, keep on praying, be ready to help, be eager to practice hospitality. You know, if we want to take stock of our lives and how well we are living in the spirit, that's a great checklist. That's a great checklist. Um, It's the measuring stick. We don't measure ourselves by one another. We measure ourselves by the scripture and what God has revealed. And he never, God never measures us by other people. He measures us by how we're using the gifts of grace that he's given to us individually that is given to us so that we can bless and serve others in his body. So we're going to have a look now at some of these gifts of grace. And over the next uh, few weeks, as we go through this series, we'll be looking at different types of gifts. Uh, There's a variety of ways that we can differentiate the gifts. And um, what I'm going to share today is not the only way. But I found that this designation really useful in understanding the various gifts of the Spirit. So the designations we're going to be using are manifestational, ministry, and motivational. So how do we we class those? Well, manifestational gifts are the gifts that reveal or manifest the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it's for the building up of the church and to manifest his glory. And we're going to find them large, uh, those largely in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we will, somebody will be teaching on that later in the, ser- in the series. The ministry gifts are the gifts that have been given by Jesus to the church to empower and equip the church. And we see those largely in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 7 to 16. But what we're going to look at today are what are called the motivational gifts, the gifts that God as Father and Creator has given us when he created us. And they characterise the basic motivations or the inherent tendencies that each person has because of the way God has created us. They're different from the other categories in gifting in that they're part of who we're created to be. Really good to understand that a person with any motivational gift can be appointed to any ministry gift and can operate in any manifestational gift. And each will bring quite a different outlook to the ministry, as I hope we'll see by the end of this teaching. Everybody has a motivational gift. And these gifts contribute to the way we see and the way we do life. They're our default setting in the situations that we face in life. They characterise our basic life purpose in the sense of they uh, contribute to what drives us to do the things that we do, the way we do them, to make the choices that we make. And to fulfil their real purpose, they function best and healthiest under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is possible to misuse our gifts and use them in our own strength or for our own purposes rather than under the Holy Spirit's direction. So why is God given different motivational giftings? You know, it's because each gift has a particular focus and allows that needs can be seen that would be overlooked by those with other gifts. You know, at times this can be a source of frustration. Have you ever thought, why are people doing it that way instead of this way? Or why, why, don't, why doesn't somebody see that need? and do something about it? Why doesn't somebody see their heart? Or, this should be such a priority in the church. Why isn't the church doing something about it? 
sometimes it, it appears that people don't respond the way we think they should. You know, that is a little clue, it should be the little signal that our gift needs to come in play, into play, because it can help others to see what we see and perhaps what they're missing. A more complete picture can be gained, but conversely, it also gives us the opportunity to consider another perspective that can round out our view. So let's have a look at verses 6 to 8. Romans 12, verses 6 to 8. We've read them already, and in this, this, uh, these scriptures, we find that there are seven gifts listed. Prophesying, ministering or serving, teaching, encouraging or, or exhorting, giving, leading or organising, and showing kindness and mercy. What I want us to do this morning is to have a look at some of the characteristics of these giftings, but also some of the misuses, because sometimes we can um, see more... The misuses usually occur because we're using them in our own strength. Um, looking at both the characteristics and the misuses can help us identify our dominant gifting um, and... So I want to, as, as we go through, see if you can recognise yourself as we go through these giftings. But also look for gaining an understanding of why other people see life differently to you. Because these motivational giftings are out of who God's created us to be. And we can look at things differently. I'll tell you in advance, um, lots of words today, lots of go up on the screen... I, don't, I suggest you don't try and write them all down. Feel free to take a photo if that's helpful. But otherwise, in a few weeks' time in July, we will actually be posting this with the notes on the Grace Life website, and we can let you know when that happens. Um, yeah, because there's no way that you're going to get all this, all this down today. But what, what I want us to do is not just listen to the words, think, where am I in this? Do I see myself? Do I see others in that? And does it give me a better understanding of why somebody else does things differently, sees things differently? So the first thing we want to look at is prophecy. And we're told to prophesy with as much faith as God has given you. So the, the motivation for the person uh, with the gift of prophecy is to use scripture to reveal unrighteous motives and actions. They proclaim the truth and they expose sin. And we have up on the, the screen a list of characteristics and misuses. So things like they need to express themselves, especially in matters of right and wrong. They make quick, quick impressions of people. They're alert to dishonesty and they desire justice. They're open about their own faults and commit themselves wholeheartedly to what they do. They're loyal to the truth versus loyal to people. They're, willingness, they're willing to suffer for what is right and they're persuasive in defining truth. Some of the misuses, they can expose without restoring. They can jump to conclusions react harshly to sin, and unfortunately sometimes harsh, harshly to the sinner. They can be unforgiving, both of others and themselves, condemning themselves. They can be impetuous. They cut off people who fail. They can lack tact in rebuke. We call them, that was very blunt. Um, and they can dwell on the negative, uh, the negative person, the negative activity. Peter is a great example of somebody who I believe had the motivational gifting of prophecy. You know, he spoke more than every, any other disciple uh, in, the, uh, in the New Testament and he became the spokesperson for the early church. He spoke first more than any other disciple, as scripture records. Um, he was the one who sensed the dishonesty in Ananias and Sapphira. It was Peter who asked, how many times do we have to forgive? But he was also very open about confessing um, his sinful, his condition as a sinful man. You know, when others were leaving, Peter said, I will stay, because where else can I go? Jesus has the words of eternal life. 
He rejoiced that he was counted worthy to suffer for Christ when he was beaten for obeying God rather than men. And in his preaching on the day of Pentecost, many came to know Christ. You know, as we look at the writings of the New Testament, and as I was, I was preparing for this, you know, I saw that in the key writers, so the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, and then Acts obviously uh, is also written by Luke, and then much of the New Testament by Paul, each of those men had a different motivational gifting. And so as they present uh, their account of the life of Christ and the life of the early church, uh, their gifting came through. Uh, Peter, we don't have a Gospel of Peter, but we understand that what uh, John Mark wrote in the Gospel of Mark is largely Peter's interpretation. It's the shortest Gospel. It's very clear, to the point, black and white, this is what happened. Um, so Peter... The second gift that we see is serving others, and we're told that if we're going to serve, if we have the motivational gift to serve others, we should serve well. And the motivation of the person with the gift of serving is to minister to Christ by meeting the physical and practical needs of fellow believers. By meeting the, these needs, they free others to perform their functions in the body. I just want to say right now, thank you to all those among us who serve in a practical sense uh, on our teams, the people who put down the carpets and the, put the seats out today, those who are manning the sound desk and the multimedia, those who set up all the leads and things for the, uh, for the music team today, um, those who are serving hospitality, those who will be at the info desk. These are examples of serving. Now, not everybody who serves will have the motivation for serving, but we are all called to, called to serve. And I just, I want to thank the teams here at Grace Life Ellenbrook uh, for making life easier for us to be able to come and focus on what God wants to say to us. So what are the, some of the characteristics of somebody who has the motivation to serve? They see and meet practical needs, um, which frees others to achieve their purposes. They tend to have a disregard for weariness and a difficulty saying no. They're alert to people's likes and dislikes. They'll often know how people like things done. They need appreciation, and they tend to like short-term projects. They put extra touches onto jobs, and they meet needs quickly, avoiding red tape. They get on and do it. But what can be some of the misuses? They can give unrequested help. They can let things become too important. They can work beyond their physical limits and neglect their God-given priorities. They react to overlook needs. Something that is obvious to them uh, can upset them when somebody else didn't see those things. They resent being used. They make people fit their schedule. They can be frustrated with time limits, things like schedules. And sometimes they can interfere with God's discipline and hinder repentance because they jump in too quickly. So those can be some of the misuses. You know, the person that I see in scripture that I think uh, represents this gift of serving, this motivation of serving, is Timothy. You know, Paul noted in Philippians um, that Timothy uh, was somebody who served. He says, there is no one like-minded who will naturally care for your state, as Philippians 2.20. Um, Timothy served Paul so that Paul could carry out his ministry. He had physical problems with his stomach. Um, this is only a supposition, but um, he may have been overextending extending himself. And Paul said, look after yourself. Um, twice he had Paul urged Timothy to come to him. So there was a, a need to give uh, some encouragement to keep time limits, which can be an issue for those who serve. So what about teaching? The third motivational gifting. So that if your gift is teaching, then teach well. And the motivation with this teaching gift is to make sure that the facts are accurate, so that the decisions that are based upon them can also be correct. These people clarify truth and validate information. 
So what are some of the characteristics? They need to validate information and they check out teachers. They are the ones that, as you say something, so where did you get that information? What's your source for that? That will be your teacher. Relying on primary and established sources, they will want to know where the information came from. They're good at presenting truth systematically and gather many facts. They require thoroughness, they like detail, and they're uneasy with subjective truth. They persevere with accepted teachers and they clarify misunderstandings. They find out why things happen. Some possible misuses of this teaching motivation could be that they can be proud of the knowledge that they have, that they can despise those who lack credentials, they can depend on human reason and criticise personal application. Sometimes they like to show off their research skills and they fail to be taught by the Holy Spirit. They can put their mind and their study above the leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, sometimes teachings can be taken to extremes and they're more likely to be the ones that argue about some fairly minor points. In the New Testament, the person I see that probably exemplifies this most is, is Luke. You know, in writing um, to Theophilus, both in Luke and Acts, he begins, Luke begins by explaining what he's doing and why, writing another account so that Theophilus might know the certainty of the things that he's been instructed in. He gives his credentials, Luke gives his credentials. Um, he, it's an eyewitness account, he says. He gives a systematic account. He's very orderly in his presentation. He includes more facts than in any other gospel. It is the longest gospel. He includes a lot of detail. And he commends the Bereans for checking out what Paul was teaching against the Old Testament scriptures. I hope we're seeing that while these can be very different, we need people like this. We need all these different giftings. So the fourth motivational gifting is to encourage. So it's that we are, if you have that gifting, be encouraging. And the motivation of the person with the gift of encouraging is to see Christians grow in faith and maturity so that they will fulfill all God's will and purpose for their lives and so that unbelievers will be attracted to the gospel by their lives. They stimulate faith and they promote growth. So they're committed to spiritual growth. They're able to see root problems and steps of actions to help people out of them. They raise hope that there are solutions and they can turn problems into benefits. They have a desire to be transparent and they gain insight through experience. They motivate people to act on clear steps and they desire to share face to face. What are the motivational gift of encouraging? We see some of the misuses. Sometimes they keep other people waiting because they're prepared to give as much time as it takes, regardless of what the schedule might be. Um, they often look to themselves or their own experience for solutions and can be proud of the results. They can start pro uh, projects prematurely without thinking them right through. And sometimes they can treat people as projects. They can sometimes share private illustrations without consent. Sometimes truth out of balance, set unrealistic goals for other people based on their own perception. And they can give up on uncooperative people. But when you look at the life of Paul and the writings of Paul, he was one who, his whole motivation was to see people grow in Christ. He said he would travail until Christ was formed in you in Galatians 4. That in Colossians 1, he says he wanted to present every man mature in Christ Jesus. Uh, where, whatever you read about Paul's life, he's wanting to encourage or exhort people to grow in their relationship. Um, he was concerned about the, the Christians being carnal as opposed to spiritual. And he gave specific uh, steps for growth. In Timothy, we, say, we see that he says, you know, flee youthful lusts, avoid foolish questions, follow righteousness in your heart. He gave some very clear guidelines for how to be able to walk uh, in the spirit. 
Um, we saw that even in, as we looked at the, these verses in Romans chapter 12, that they're very practical in order to help people live the life, live in the spirit, walk in the spirit. And he, he often in his letters um, expressed the desire to see people face to face. He said, I'm writing this, but I really wanted to come to you. I'm hoping to come to you soon. I want to see you face to face. So the fifth gift that we see there is giving. He says that if we have that motivational gift of giving, that we're to be generous. And the motivation of the person with the gift of giving is to make wise investments in order to advance the work of the Lord. There's an alertness uh, regarding how funds are used. And in order to have more funds available, the giver tends to be frugal with their own personal spending. If they don't have their own assets, these givers are motivated to find other sources where funds or resources can be obtained. And they entrust assets to the work of God, maximising the use of, and the results of giving. So they're able to see resources. And they invest themselves with the gift. They don't just give the thing, the money, the asset, part of them goes with that gift. They desire to give high quality and they hope that the gift is an answer to prayer. They often desire to give secretly um, and they have a concern that giving will corrupt. Um, usually they are characterised by personal thriftiness uh, they use their gifts to encourage others to give. Uh, and it's good to... They, they generally are people who confirm their giving with their spouse. Um, what are some of the misuses? Well, there can be a hoarding of resources for themselves or using gifts to control people. Um, there can be a tendency to force a higher standard of living by being dissatisfied by what they have. Um, some feel guilty about their personal assets. They reject pressure appeals and, sometimes, and therefore can sometimes miss the opportunity. They like to give in their own time. Um, sometimes they can give too sparingly to their family and their focus can change from people to projects. Sometimes they cause people to look to them rather than to God or can wait too long to give. You know, the Gospel of Matthew was written by a giver. He was a tax collector originally. So he, we see many of the misuses in the pre-conversion life of Matthew. But when he came to Christ, he... In, in his writing, had the giver's ability to discern the value and provide quality that lasted. You know, he was the one that spoke of the Magi's gifts as treasure. Um, he spoke of Mary's ointments as very precious and Joseph's tomb as new. He looked at and saw value in what was being given. You know, he was the only gospel writer that talked about giving secretly and not letting people know um, that you were giving. And he shared his gospel from the perspective of a giver. The sixth motivational gift is leadership ability. Um, we also see in another part of scripture that sometimes it's, it's organising. And Paul exhorts us in Romans that those who have that motivational gift to take their responsibility seriously take their responsibility seriously. The motivation of the person with the gift of leading or organising is to coordinate the efforts and resources of many to achieve agreed upon goals. They manage the assets of human abilities and time and they can visualise the final objective and know how and when to delegate tasks. They plan ahead and they complete tasks. So they're able to visualise, they need loyalty in the people that are working with them. They have an ability to delegate and they have an ability to withstand reaction to the leading or the task, those who don't agree with them. They can make jobs look easy and they're very alert to details. They can complete tasks quickly and are able to be decisive and they are the ones that plan right through to the clean-up. So it, it doesn't just stop at 
completing the task, it's like everything's back in its place and ready for the next group. What can be some of the misuses? They can view people as resources, only as resources. They can build loyalty with favoritism. They can use delegation to avoid work. They're unresponsive to appeals, appeals as in people coming to them and saying, I think something's not quite right. Um, and that can be difficult for them to respond to. They can put projects ahead of people. They can overlook serious faults on the basis that, but is a good worker. They can fail to explain or praise. They can force decisions on others and coerce people to do what they want. And they can lose interest in the finished job. Once it's done, they want to move on. Nehemiah in the Old Testament, I think, is a great example of having this, this motivational gift of leadership ability and organiser. You know, he visualised the, the task. He required, he actually required his workers to make an oath of commitment to actually be involved in the work of, of rebuilding uh, the walls. Um, he delegated appropriately and uh, organised the people to be the most productive that they could be. He dealt with opposition. Um, he took a seemingly impossible task of the walls of Jerusalem broken down um, and he made it easy by breaking it up into smaller tasks that groups of people could do very, and very alert to, to detail. The seventh motivational gift is the person who shows kindness or mercy that they're to do it gladly. And the motivation of the person with the gift of kindness or mercy is to mentally and emotionally relate to the feelings of those around them. They concentrate on giving empathy and comfort during times of distress, and they endeavour to remove distress and share burdens. They're deeply loyal to friends, and they have a need for deep friendships. They empathise with hurting people, and they make decisions based on the greater good. They're deeply sensitive to loved ones, and they attract people in distress. They desire to remove hurts and they measure acceptance by the closeness of relationship. But there can be some misuses of this gift. They can take up offences very easily for other people. They can become possessive. They can tolerate evil. They can fail to be firm. They can lean on emotions rather than reason. They can react to God's purposes and fail to show deference to others' uh, needs for that person. They, they can tend to want to keep relationships for themselves and they cut off insensitive people. They're attracted to prophets because <laughs> prophets are often the ones in the church that um, seem to get the hardest time and um, so those with mercy are often attracted. You often find within couples if there's one with a prophetic gifting, there's often, of, often a spouse who has the gift of kindness or mercy. You know, John in the New Testament um, is a great example of somebody who's motivated by this gifting. He described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. It doesn't mean that Jesus didn't love the, the other disciples, but that's how he saw himself. That relationship was primary to how he understood himself. He wrote the most about love, both in his gospel but also in his letters. The first letter that he wrote to the Christians was um, that they should stop hating each other and stop hurting each other. So he was, he was concerned about the way relationships were being done. Jesus gave responsibility for his grieving mother to John because Jesus knew that John would look after her. Um, they often need physical closeness. John needed physical closeness. He was the one who leant on Jesus' um, chest at supper um, and wanted to sit with Jesus in glory. And sometimes we think, you know, that was a bad thing. But actually what it, what it showed was his mother, he wanted to be close. He wanted to be near you know, there are a few of us that are fully described by only one of these gifts. Usually there's a mix with different traits from each of these giftings present to some degree. But usually it will be one of, uh, will be the dominant trait for that person, especially in times of stress. 
these gifts are foundational and they're different and they affect the way we do all aspects of life. They, it is through that lens that we see um, every situation in life and our part in it. People don't have all the gifts equally. And when facing different and, and more challenging situations, they will usually respond in their dominant gifting. So to make that hopefully a little bit clearer, I want us to have a look at the use of motivational giftings in the church. I want you to imagine for a minute. You are part of a group of Christians who have met together to organise the ideal church. Okay? Just close your eyes for a minute. And without overthinking it, what is the first thing that you think the ideal church needs? Okay, as we go through this, just keep that thought in mind. So each of these Christians that has come together in the group represents a different motivational gift. What each one emphasises will tend to be based on their spiritual outlook that's influenced by their motivational gift. So as, I, as we present these, just see if you hear yourself in any of these. So the one with the gift of prophecy will tend to want well-prepared sermons that expose sin, proclaim righteousness and warn of the judgment to come. They want things to be laid out black and white and really clearly. Those who are serving with the gift of serving or ministering, they feel the ideal church should have practical assistance to every member of the church to encourage them and to help them fulfill their responsibilities. The one with the, the motivation, the motivational gift of teaching, says we need in-depth Bible studies with special emphasis on the precise meanings of words. The one with the gift of exhorting, personal counselling and encouragement should be available for every member to assist them in applying scriptural truth to their daily living. We need to help them do whatever it takes to help them live this out. Giving, the person with the motivational gift of giving will want generous programs of financial assistance to staff, missionaries and other ministries. Leading, The person with the motivational gift for leading will want a smooth running organisation uh, throughout the church so that every phase will be carried out decently and in order. And mercy or kindness, special outreach and concern for the precise and varying feelings of individuals with a readiness to meet their needs. Seven people with seven different motivations, if they come together to look at what the ideal church would be like, will give a well-rounded picture if they will listen to one another. And, it, and I hope this example shows the importance and of and the necessity for every gift that God has given to be in operation. Otherwise, important areas of input and care for the church would be overlooked. Together, they cause the one body to work effectively and to make manifest God's great provision for the church. You know, the ultimate expression of every gift is personified in Christ. The more we become like him, the more we will express each of these gifts in a balanced way, even though we will use them from one dominant motivation when we're functioning with our gift, there'll be a sense of purpose and joy and fulfilment and we'll see maximum fruit for minimum weariness when we function within our gifting. Having said that, what we're talking about is the motivation, what motivates us to do what we do. If you've managed today to kind of think, oh, I think I'm, I might have an idea of what motivates me, what kind of what my motivational gift would be, we need to understand, though, that each of us is commanded in Scripture to perform the functions of all seven gifts, regardless of what our particular motivation will be. So none of us are let off the hook <laughs> and say, well, I'm like this, and so that's how I'm going to function, and I don't need to worry about the others. 
because in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that we should all have a desire to prophesy. He would that everybody would prophesy. We can all prophesy, but from our own motivational gifting. And so what comes out of our mouth and the concerns that um, motivate the prophecy can be different. In Galatians 5, it says, By love, serve one another. We are all called to serve. In Matthew 28, go and teach all nations. In Hebrews chapter 3, but exhort one another or encourage one another daily. In Luke chapter 6, give and it will be given to you. In 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done decently and in order. And in Matthew 7, blessed are the merciful or blessed are those who show kindness. The fact that we are motivated by a particular gifting doesn't mean that we don't function in other areas, but we will bring that same motivation. Um, the the behaviours might look similar, but the underlying motivation can be different. And it's only as we learn the skills of the other six gifts that we're able to use our own gift effectively and to appreciate what others bring to the conversation, their insight, the way they see things. Um, people will see things really differently. So I wonder if you just, if you would, just close your eyes for a minute. Graham, could I have you come up and just help us for this? Thank you. So I wonder if you would just ask Father, who have you created me to be? What motivates me? How have you gifted me so that I can contribute to building up your body, the church, and reach the lost? And is my gift benefiting this part of your body in which you've planted me? We're just going to take a couple of minutes to sit with the Holy Spirit. If we don't know our gifts, if we don't know the way God's created us and how he wants to place us in the body, then the body can be missing out. So Father, who have you created me to be? What motivates me? How have you gifted me to contribute? And am I doing that, Lord? Am I benefiting? Lord, your body here at Grace Life Ellenbrook with the giftings that you've given me. Let's just wait on the Lord for a few couple of minutes. Father, Father, we thank you that you have created every person here and in fact, every person who has ever come into this earth, Lord, that we are completely unique, 
There has never been and there will never be another person just like us. But Father, you know the purpose for which you have brought us into this world at this time. Lord, living where we're living right now. And Lord, you've already equipped us. You've given us all we need. Father, that you would help us become aware of what motivates us. Lord, what drives us, what what informs our decisions. Father, that we would be willing to bring our gift, Lord, for the benefit of your body. Father, too, that you would open our hearts and that we would recognise, Lord, the value of the gift of one another. Lord, you said in Romans chapter 12, in your grace, you've given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Father, that we would appreciate the gifts in one another, the need for difference. Father, we, we thank you. Lord, that we would, um, in this as in all other things, Lord, that we would be led by your Spirit. We would live in your Spirit. We would walk with your Spirit. Lord, that indeed we might be the blessing that you have desired us to be. Father, where we see that there are times that we misuse the gift that you've given us, Lord, that we would just bring that to you. You're the one who does that work in our hearts to transform us and to conform us to the image of Christ. Father, we're so grateful for that. Father, if there's anyone among us today, Lord, who doesn't yet know you, who's not yet in relationship with you. Father, that you would draw them, even as Wendy shared. Lord, you draw and make us ready to receive forgiveness, restoration. Lord, the opportunity to come into relationship with Jesus to come into relationship with you, Father, because of what Jesus has done. You gave your Son that we might exchange our brokenness, our separation from you, Lord, for a relationship. Father, thank you. Lord, just continue to do your work of grace among us, we pray. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.